Well, it's dawn here. Expectations abound for the day and grace abounds for yesterday. This is the fourth recording of 12 on the structure and properties of organic molecules. It's a very important presentation that we're covering today. Because what we'll be able to do after today's presentation is to be able to look at a structure like we have in the center here, our cat, a, our analog, our particular type of penicillin. We'll be able to, after today, look at pi bonding and sigma bonding in a different way. Being able to understand how electron density within bonding between carbons and oxygens and nearby lone pairs on a nitrogen 2, a carbon-oxygen double bond, are influenced by what we call resonance effects, or I should just say more accurate, by resonance and by inductive effect. So we're moving into <clears throat> not just seeing orbitals behind the letters and lines, but being able to take and shift electron density Within the sigma bonding, that's an inductive effect, and it's already occurred for penicillin here. There is already a resettling, you might say, of electrons as atoms started to come together, and they had differences in electronegativities, or we had a nitrogen that was next to a pi bond. There's been a resettling of electron density that we need to capture within the, in, within the connections that we have in front of us. So that's being able to see these partial charges, places where electron density has settled, based on resonance forms is very important. So let's start. Well, how do we start? Well, the best way to, is to just sort of define, <coughs> I'll use an example here of a molecule that's very that's common to organic chemistry, would be benzene. Benzene has within it a pi, these three pi bonds between six carbons, and we have the six sigma bonds. And what we need to remember is that with organic molecules, we have to consider the behavior or electron movement, or re replacement, we said, or settling within the sigma bonds and within the pi bonds. Now, for benzene, we know that all carbons are equivalent in electronegativity. So there would be no shift of electron density through the sigma bonding in the benzene because there is no difference in electronegativity of any two atoms we pick in benzene. But if we were to take out one of those carbons and to put an oxygen in its place. Now we start to have, and it's going to be then charged, if we replace this carbon with an oxygen, we'll have a charge, three bonds off of it. If we do that, now we have an atom that pulls electron density to it, but not just through the sigma bonding that we have here. That would be an inductive effect because the oxygen is more electronegative inductive effects look at just electronegativity differences. The oxygen is more electronegative than a carbon. And beyond that, this oxygen is positively charged. Now folks, it may be Christian to give in an altruistic way and to give is actually a joyful thing, but it hurts still. It can it can take and take food off your table to bring food to another one, to a, new, to a neighbor. It can hurt. And in the natural world, we would say that if we give a lot of money away, we will be poor and we will suffer. Maybe something stands in its place that we enjoy more, but we will suffer if we give all our money away. So this oxygen, in a sense, has become poor because he has positive charge, more bonding than he really wants, He's hurting. He likes more. He would like more electron density. So if he's positive, he doesn't become less desirous of electron density, less desirous of money. If we treat that as electron density, he becomes more desirous. He's pulling in on that carbon even more now. 
but that's only half the story of how he's pulling towards himself some electron density. He's also pulling by resonance effects. So these two are working together. And you say, well, how do you see that? Well, it has a sigma bond on the right, but we designate, we are showing here a pi bond and a sigma bond on the left. So there's certainly, certainly some inductive effect towards itself pulling from this carbon. But we also have a pulling, if I can get this to work here, a pulling of pi electron density. We'll just call this a resonance effect. It's sort of a really just my, a term that may not be seen much. We usually just talk about resonance. But we're going to pull not only the sigma electron density, but the pi electron density towards this oxygen. It'll just naturally pull some of that electron density that's held less tightly. That electron density is in a weaker bond and it's held less tightly and it's going to pull towards itself. So this is via a different bonding, this resonance effect, than an inductive effect. So really it's just two types of effects because you have sigma and pi bonding. And we're just capturing that. So let's finish with this um, reading of the definition. Look at these examples of just inductive effect. And let's move into how we draw resonance forms to capture this effect. Resonance effects is the shift of electron density through the pi bonding network. Now this is an for all cases, but for many, many cases, when drawing resonance forms, you're looking at electron movement through the pi bonding system, the pi bonding system, the pi bonding network. Non-bonding electrons can be involved. We'll see that as we go through this presentation and the next. Remember, resonance usually trumps inductive effects. Why? Because it's involving the movement of weaker bonded electrons. They can move more easily. What is resonance? Why do we have this pull towards that oxygen that was partially, or that was full positive? Well, it's first important to see the pathway, the conduit system, how electron density can move within an, a molecule. So let's do that by looking at an acetate anion. Now, acetate anion is pretty common to organic chemistry. An acetate anion has a CO double bond an oxygen that's negative, and a methyl group. We can also call this a carboxylate. Resonance is the charge to localization, we said, through the pi bonding network, or that's where we often, what we often see. So what we're going to take now is the opposite charge for the on oxygen, one that's negative, and now he's in excess. He doesn't pull as much as we saw in the last slide. He's really pushing out because he has an excess of electron density, so it's by, by, by knowing electrons, they want to spread themselves out as much as possible. We're going to look to spread this out. But before we do that, let's get to the orbital picture. So we're going to change this view of that oxygen as sp3, having maximum separation of the three non-bonding pairs and the bonding pair, to sp2, so that we can gain resonance. We're going to put one lone pair into a p orbital, so that it can spread out into the pi bond next door. So let's imagine then this highlighted oxygen as sp2 hybridized, one of the lone pairs, we'll say this one here, in a p orbital, and the other two just in hybrid orbitals that are not shown. So we're going to say two of the lone pairs, which are in hybrid orbitals, are not shown. We're just going to show this one that we've circled. It's in what orbital? A p orbital. Why did, how did we get it to a p orbital? We considered this oxygen to be sp2 hybridized. We can do that if we gain resonance. If we can gain resonance, we're not going to set the hybridization by maximum separation like we did in the last slide. No. When we have an atom with lone pair next to a pi bond, we're going to consider that atom to be sp2 hybridized. Now, if we see the orbital picture of the acetate anion. We see a pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen here. And I'm noting these two electrons as being within that pi bond. And for this oxygen, not showing the two in hybrid orbitals, but the one in the p orbital, we have a oxygen with a lone pair in a p orbital that can be conjugated, yoked, to the neighboring pi bond. So we have an overlap of atomic p orbitals. That is critical.
when we, before we draw resonance forms, we should really see the yoking together of p orbitals within that molecule or part of the molecule where we're going to consider resonance. So then, and only then, and this is where most textbooks would draw, you can consider the electrons in the lone pair state to drop down to a pi bond state and these electrons to move up and out of the way and be occupying the p orbital for this oxygen and that would get us to a resonance form, a resonance form of this structure. It's very critical as a skill to draw, the skill of drawing resonance forms is very critical that you learn how to do that because we can then understand that this negative charge is not just on this oxygen but it's expressed on this oxygen as we consider the resonance form that can be drawn for this acetate anion. So really these two resonance forms that we have drawn, we have a structure that incorporates the expression of both these resonance forms. We call it a hybrid. The hybrid is a mixture of these two and since these two are equal in energy it's a 50-50 mix of these two resonance forms that gives us the hybrid. So we would say minus one half on this. This is a sorry electrostatic potential map where we're showing the methyl group here, the two oxygens, and red denotes more electron density, blue denotes less electron density. So if you take and model this structure using some computer uh, modeling program, it'll show these two oxygens to have equal amount of that excess negative charge. And we understand this equal amount of the excess negative charge by seeing these resonance forms. All right, what, is the, what are some rules for drawing resonance forms? Well, let's go through this quickly. If starting with an ion charge structure, move pi or lone pair electrons to the positive charge, or like we have in the last presentation, we're moving away from the negative charge. If starting with a neutral, this is going to be the next presentation, find pushers, O's or N's next to a pi bond that have lone pairs, or polars we call them, oxygens or nitrogens that are in a pi bond. Now, how do I rank resonance forms once I've drawn some? Always remember that those resonance forms wherein O's and N's and C's all have eight electrons around them, they are the favored resonance forms. Those that minimize charge are the favored resonance forms. And those, and this is our third and priority, stabilization of charge based on electronegativity of that atom. So to have a positive on a carbon is better than having a positive on an oxygen. But that rule is often trumped by the octet rule. The octet rule. Having the negative on an oxygen would be better than having it on a carbon. If we had two resonance forms where the only thing that was different is where the negative charge was located. Other considerations is that we must have that overlap we just saw on the last page of p orbitals in most cases to have resonance forms that we can draw. The degree of stabilization due to resonance is greatest when we have equal mixture or close to it of resonance forms and atoms in a ring cannot be sp hybridized and the reason for that is because this carbon having sp hybridization we want to be linear so we can't have if we were to consider maybe an, a uh, positive charge on this carbon and we had a, a lone pair or something like that next to that carbon here and we wanted to put that into a pi bond well we can't do that the lone pair coming down there's a lot of reasons but one of them is we just don't want to have an sp carbon in a ring Let's finish with just two applications of all these rules that we've learned. And let's remember that we want to see the orbital picture here. So that first, this carbon is negatively charged. We want to say that this carbon with a lone pair can be sp2 hybridized and will be to gain resonance. So we have three bonding pairs using the hybrid orbitals. The three sp2 hybrid orbitals we're using these and this carbon is using hybrid orbitals to bond, to make sigma bonds. But one of the uh, pairs here, this non-bonding pair, this lone pair, is in a p orbital. 
So that p orbital can be overlapping with the p orbital that's overlapping with this p orbital, and it's overlapping with this p orbital and this p orbital. So we can kind of, before we start drawing resonance forms, it's often good just to say, hey, this is really what I'm considering. These methyl groups are not sp2 hybridized. They do not have p orbitals. So I'm really focusing in on just this region of the molecule when I'm trying to draw resonance forms. That now having established where we have overlap of or p orbitals, we can say the negative charge could have moved, or can move, I should say, to the right where we can get now the following resonance form where the negative charge is now shown on this oxygen, but we didn't have just this direction that we can go in, we can also go in the other direction and you don't choose, you just draw both. So, and you say, well that's very similar to the structure above. Oh, I know. And I could make the one, and I'm just going to go ahead and go all the way to bond line, or to skeletal, I'm not going to draw that C. So we have the negative charge now shown on this oxygen. And that's, very, that's, you say, it's the same as up here. Well, no, the only way I could make these the same is to flip this over and then lay it down on this because these are still two distinct oxygens. And when you draw resonance forms, you really hold that baby flat and still. And the only thing you move are pi and lone pair electrons. So we do have two oxygens and we're going to use them. We have two oxygens that can share that negative charge along with that carbon. So this is just the way we deal with negative charges. Now what is the, I guess, combination or contributions of these three resonance forms to what we remember is the hybrid, the mixture of these three resonance forms. We know it's not representing this structure for just looking at this resonance form or just the one, just this one or this one. It's a mixture of all three resonance forms that we see in the resonance hybrid, the true structure behind this 2,4 pentadione anion. So how do we consider the contributions? Remember the, the three considerations. Octet rule, the um, minimization of charge, and the location of charge. Let's look at the octet rule. Every atom has eight electrons around it. Two, four, six, eight for this carbon. Two, four, six, eight for this oxygen. The same for this oxygen. This oxygen now has a negative charge if we draw the resonance form, but it still has eight. This still has eight and this carbon, still having that hydrogen, still has eight. It's the same thing down here since these aren't, too, these aren't very different. So the octet rule is not in play here. Minimization of charge, negative to negative to negative. We've maintained a single negative charge. We haven't added charge anywhere. And then the last location of charge, C, O, and O. Ah, this one would not be as contributing to the resonance hybrid as these two because the location of the charge is a C and it's not as stable as having the negative charge on oxygen, these two. So these would be equal in their, contri equal in their contribution to the hybrid. This would be less contributing because it has a negative on the carbon. Well, that's it. That gets us started in discussion of resonance forms for cations and anions. In the next presentation we'll be looking at neutral structures and applying these same rules how to draw resonance forms for uh, molecules or ions. We'll be jumping though to this second consideration pushers and pullers. Still can use these factors that influence the amount of contribution of each resonance form but neutral structures are a little more difficult. You don't have an obvious starting point with a positive or negative charge drawn. Bye-bye.